Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tagus uh, Research uh, Insight Seminar. This is a grassland seminar. <clears throat> it's the Torun series. And this morning, we're going to discuss the role of grass breeding and evaluation in increasing the sustainability of pasture-based production systems. So we have a, an interesting morning uh, on offer for, for, for you all. Uh, we have three um, talks this morning. Um, the first of which will be um, Pat Conahan, who heads up the grass breeding program in Tagus, talking and Pat will discuss the Tagus grass, um, so a grass uh, and clover breeding program in Oak Park. This will be followed by Steve, Dr. Stephen Byrne, who heads up the uh, genomic selection in Tagus, and Stephen will be discussing the, the role of genomic selection in grass breeding. And the final talk, which um, we will be given this morning, will be given by uh, Dr. Thomas Tubbert, who will uh, discuss the new developments uh, to the Pasture Profit Index. So I, I, I would encourage you all to ask plenty of questions, and that can be done through the um, Q&A um, uh, box. So um, we'll go straight into the first talk, which um, will, that Pat, Pat will, will, will take us through on the um, Tagus Grass and Clover Breeding Program. So thank you, Pat. Um, thank you, Michael, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so today I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Chagas Grass and Clover Breeding Program. Um, firstly, to put the talks into perspective, variety improvement, it's a 15 to 20 year process consisting of three main stages. Stage one is breeding, and this is the development of a new variety, and this stage takes about seven to ten years. The second stage is variety testing. So before a variety can be released, it must be independently tested. This stage takes about five to seven years. And in Ireland, um, variety testing is undertaken um, by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine and Chagas. Stage three is commercialization. Um, Chagas is not directly involved in the commercialization of its varieties. Um, rather, it licenses its varieties to a seed company our main commercial partner is Goldcrop, who have exclusive rights to produce, distribute, market, and sell all seed of our new varieties. And commercialization takes at least two years. So today, myself and Stephen are going to focus on stage one breeding, and Tomas then will talk um, about variety testing. So what is plant breeding? Um, plant breeding may be defined as human-directed evolution. Evolution is the genetic change in a species over time. And a good example of this is maize. And in this picture, we can see the evolution of maize from its wild species on the left to the modern hybrid varieties of today. An evolution is a natural and ongoing process. However, it's slow. It can take thousands of years to see a noticeable change in a species. Also, the direction of evolution favored by man, nature may be different. So for example, nature tends to favor traits that um, promote survival, um, such as repeat heading, as it increases, increases um, seed production. In contrast, repeat head, heading is a trait which farmers don't like, as it's associated with increased stemminess and reduced quality. Breeding is therefore necessary to speed up the process of evolution, to ensure that evolution proceeds in a direction favorable to man's needs. Also, because the production environment is constantly changing, Therefore, the best variety today may not be the best variety in 10 years time due to changing climate, new and evolving pests and diseases, and new farm regulations. And breeding is also highly cost effective. In the UK, it's estimated that for every one pound invested in wheat and barley breeding, there is a return of 40 pounds to the economy. The Chagas breeding station is based in Oak Park in Carlow on 225 hectare research farm. And this is indicated on the map by the red square. Um, the blue squares on the map indicate the, the locations of the variety evaluation sites, which are run by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in Ireland, and the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in Northern Ireland. The breeding program in Oak Park and Carlow was set up in the early 1960s. Initially, the primary focus was on research and breeding methods and variety evaluation, and the breeding of commercial varieties was only a secondary focus. Thus, in the first 25 years of the life of the program, only two varieties were released. 
The first of these varieties and first perennial ryegrass variety to be released was Green Isle in 1980, and Green Isle is an early tetraploid variety. The second variety to be released and the first white clover variety to be released in 1983 was Aran, and Aran is still being sold and used today in a number of countries almost 40 years after it was first released. In 1985, the program was restructured. Now the breeding of commercial varieties became the primary focus and breeding and, and research and breeding methods became a secondary focus. The variety evaluation was taken over by the Department of Agriculture. So given this new change in focus, what in the, while in the first 25 years, only two varieties were released, in the following 35 years, 41 varieties were released. In 2002, a new molecular genetics program was established in Oak Park, and Stephen will talk more about this after me. In 2013, Gold Crop between, became our new commercial partner, and Gold Crop is a seeds and input company with headquarters based in Cork, and Gold Crop have exclusive rights to produce, distribute, and sell all seed of our varieties worldwide. In 2017, Chagas developed its first perennial ryegrass variety by genomic selection. And in 2023, the first Irish bred red clover variety Ferga will be released. The overall mission of the program is to support the sustainable and profitable animal production from grassland in Ireland by breeding improved varieties for Irish farm systems. The ultimate target then is to breed a variety that offers sufficient yield of quality forage to meet the animal feed demand curve over the entire season, plus the provision of adequate winter feed as silage. Breeding is focused on three species. In perennial ryegrass, we breed both diploid and tetraploid varieties and primarily focus on intermediate and late heading groups. In white clover, we breed small, medium and large leaf size varieties. And in red clover, we focus on diploid varieties only. The traits for improvement includes forage yield, and this includes the seasonal distribution of the yield across spring, summer, and autumn, also silage production, and also the total annual production. Quality is very important, and we, this is in, increased through a function of improving digestibility, leafiness, graze out, and disease resistance. Persistency is very important as receding is expensive, and persistency may be defined as the changing ground cover and yield over time. And it's also a function of grazing resilience and disease resistance. Sustainability has become a, a hot topic recently and will grow in importance. And this is also a function of nitrogen use efficiency, which is which may be defined as the yield increase, sorry, as increasing the yield per unit of applied nitrogen. In clovers, we also aim to improve nitrogen fixation and clover content. So now just very brief, just very briefly to talk about the breeding process. So if you consider every variety, a variety, within that variety, every seed and every plant is unique in terms of its genetics and its agronomic performance. Therefore, while the average performance of the variety may be 100, some plants within that variety will perform significantly less and other plants will perform significantly better. The goal and the objective then of breeding is to evaluate um, a large number of plants within, the, within this variety, to select the elite plants, the best performing plants, and to recombine or intercross them to form a new improved um, population or variety. And this new improved population or variety should then um, give an increase in performance. So in this theoretical example, we see we've increased the performance from 100 to 110. The process is then repeated Again, through a combination of evaluation, selection, and recombination, again, get an incremental improvement in, in performance. And again, it's, it's, it's a continuous process. Evaluation may be based on sward plots. And in this picture on the left, we see um, plots of perennial ryegrass in Oak Park. In the second picture, we see plots of white clover in Oak Park. Um, Evaluation may also be best on individual plants. And here we see space plants grown in the field in Oak Park. Alternatively, those individual plants may be grown um, in or around the glasshouse in trays or pots. We measure those plots, plots or plants through a series of different techniques. 
including cutting and weighing, weighing the yield from the plots um, using a machine called a Haldrup Forage Harvester. We also test um, the material um, under animal grazing. In this picture, we see we have sheep grazing white clover, and in the one below that, we have cattle grazing perennial ryegrass plots. An evaluation may also be based on DNA, which Stephen will talk about. So the evaluation has continued for a number of locations um, over a number of years. Early in the breeding cycle, um, all evaluations are conducted in Oak Park, but um, later on in the process and on the development of the candidate varieties, evaluation will take place in Ireland, the UK, and a number of sites throughout mainland Europe. We test our perennial ryegrass for two years and our clovers for a minimum of three years. So in this picture, we see some of the after recombination methods. So after evaluating, selecting um, the best plants within, within a variety, we then recombine or intercross them to, perform, to produce a new improved population. Perennial ryegrass is wind pollinated and that determines our crossing methods. So in the first picture on the left, we see two um, plants of perennial ryegrass in, in pots and they're put together and there's a pollen proof bag put over them and the bag is shaken every day and the, trans the pollen is then transferred between the two plants. In the next picture we see 50 plants of perennial ryegrass sowed down in a field of winter oats and the winter oats acts as a pollen barrier and prevents foreign pollen from crossing um, with that multiplication. In the next picture we see a larger multiplication again within winter oats of 300 space plants, and in the following picture, an even larger multiplication of a drilled sward within the winter oats. Um, the plots are cut with a combine as seen in this picture, and this is the seed taken off the combine. So in this picture, we see um, multiplications of various size in Oak Park. This is a field of winter wheat. Um, and again, you can see the multiplications ranging from small to large, depending on the number of plants within the multiplication. The big difference between um, perennial ryegrass and clover is that clover is insect pollinated. Therefore, recombination is done in polytunnels. And here we see a number of polytunnels in Oak Park. In the second picture, you can see there's pots of white clover inside the polytunnel. There's a commercial bumblebee hive and the bees then intercross the plants for us. Um, recombination or crossing may also be done manually using a toothpick, but this is highly laborious and tedious. So since 1985, the program has released 1.1 new varieties per year. This is, consists of 31 perennial ryegrass varieties, one red clover variety, and 11 white clover varieties. Three commonly asked questions about genetic gain are as follows. The first is how much genetic gain have we made in, to present? And it's considered that the annual increase in genetic gain is about four to 6% per year, which we consider modest. And there's a number of reasons for this, um, including the biological characteristics of um, forage grass and clover, the length of the breeding and evaluation cycle. And also there tends to be much less investment in breeding of forage, crop, forage crops than there is of the grain crops. Digestibility has been estimated to have increased by only 1% per decade. And this is primarily because it's a relatively new trait being added only, only added to the Irish recommended list in 2009. So given it takes about 20 years to produce a new variety, the effects of increased breeding effort for quality are only starting to come true now. The second question is how much future genetic gain can we expect? And with new technologies, including molecular breeding, optical sensors and machine learning, we expect a significant increase in genetic gain, and it's estimated that genetic gain will increase by two to three fold. And the final question is, are there any limits to genetic gain? And to answer this, we should look at um, the, the, the breeding of um, two other grain crops. So if we see that cultivated grain crops, which have undergone a significant amount of breeding, differ significantly from their wild relatives, so in this picture, you see a wheat wild relative, which looks nothing like the modern wheat varieties of today. And here we see maize with the wild relative on the left and the modern hybrid on the right. In contrast, the wild versus cultivated forage grasses are morphologically very similar. And this, from this, we can conclude that forage breeding is still in its infancy and huge potential remains. 
So what of the future? Um, so in terms of the future, um, it takes about 20 years to produce a new grass or clover variety. Sorry, yeah. In terms of the future, it, it um, takes about 20 years to produce a new grass or clover variety. Therefore, the short term for, for a breeding program will be 20 years, and that's the year 2040. So current topics which are gaining in importance and would expect it to be even more important in 20 years time include sustainability, uh, climate change, environmental footprint, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, habitat, animal health and welfare, and food quality. So the question is, in the year 2014, will the typical sward be a, a perennial ryegrass monoculture as, as per the left-hand side, or will it be a wide mix of different species as per the picture on the right? And I think it's highly unlikely it'll be um, solely a monoculture on, as per the left-hand side, but the question being how, how close or how wide a mixture it'll be. So if we break down the three major um, groups, grasses, legumes, and herbs, and consider what would be the primary, secondary, and tertiary um, species in 2040. In grasses, the current most important species is perennial ryegrass, and I expect that to continue to be the primary species going forward, both diploid and tetraploids. Um, tetraploids tend to be higher yielding and higher quality and have better graze out, but diploids offer better, better density and swards, and I think this is, is important. Um, for, for wetland, um, for heavy land, and also to pre pre prevent the ingress of weeds. It's also quite possible that there'll be greater restrictions in herbicide use in 20 years time, and a dense ward will be vital to keep out weeds. The secondary and the tertiary species, um, I honestly don't know what it'll be in 20 years time. The current most, second most popular um, grass species in Ireland is Italian ryegrass. But that's really only suitable as a short-term crop. So as a permanent pasture crop, um, it's, it's unlikely that that, that that would be the case. So the question being as out of the other potential grass species, which of those species offer something um, to complement um, or different or to add to perennial ryegrass and which of those species would, 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 has the potential to be a future main or companion species. Legumes, the primary species at present is white clover, and I expect that to continue to be the case. Um, the secondary species would be red clover, and I expect that to continue to be the case. And again, there's significant breeding both of, for both of these species. The tertiary species, I don't know. There are a number of interesting species out there, but um, they've undergone um, very little species, but they do have a lot of potential to add to the, add to the mix. So for example, St. Foin, Birds Boat, Trefoil and Lotus um, contain condensed tannins, which, which is anti-bloating effect. So it'd be highly useful in a high, high um, clover content sward. Pura clover has a very deep permanent tap root, so it's highly persistent. So certainly these species have something to offer. In terms of herbs, the two front runners at present are chicory and plantain. Um, I don't know which of those in 20 years time will be the primary and secondary species. The tertiary species, again, I'm not sure what that is either at present, but again, there's a, lot, there's a number of possibilities, yarrow, sheep, sheep, parsley, and burnet. So in conclusion, the Chagas Farage breeding program continues to develop improved varieties of grass and clover for Irish farm systems. The introduction of new technology, including genomic selection, will significantly accelerate genetic gain. There's no evidence that we're approaching the limits to genetic progress and the future is in our hands. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the support of all present and forage breeding staff and our commercial partners. Thank you for listening. Okay, Pat. Thanks very much for that. And um, I think it sets us up nicely for the next talk, uh, which is uh, Stephen Byrne, which was go who um, and Stephen is going to talk about the role of uh, genomic selection in, as a methodology in grass breeding. So thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the application of uh, genomic selection um, to grass breeding. 
So how we can use uh, DNA information as a tool to support the development of new grass varieties. So as Pat mentioned, um, this is a tool we're now developing and using uh, in the Chagas breeding program. And our motivation for using this breeding tool is to support development uh, of new varieties that meet the needs of Ireland's grassland farmers. So I want to answer uh, three questions through the presentation. Uh, the first is what is genomic selection? Then how do we study the DNA of grasses and then use this information in plant breeding? And then finally, what are the benefits of genomic selection and specifically what are the benefits to forage grass breeding? So Pat has given an excellent overview on the methodology of forage breeding, and this is key uh, for what I'm going to talk about. So in this example, we have a population of plants uh, and the trait we want to select for in this example is spring forage yield. So in this population, some plants will have very poor uh, spring yield potential, uh, many will have average spring yield potential, and then some plants will have very high spring yield potential. So the goal of grass breeding is to identify and select the best plants and to use these as parents uh, to produce a new improved population. So our new uh, population is shown in pink and we can see that the average spring yield of this new population represented by the pink dotted line has shifted upwards in comparison to the starting population. And as Pat pointed out, if we keep repeating this in a process known as recurrent selection, then we keep improving the population over time. And so what we're basically doing here is increasing the frequency of genes that have a positive impact on forage yield. And so the key stage here is trying to identify the best plants in the population. So we've already heard about one approach for selection uh, from Pat, which was genotypic selection. So he identified the best plants by carrying out extensive field evaluations on lots of families. So he crosses plants uh, to produce families, goes through around a multiplication uh, to get enough seed for establishing families uh, in field trials, and then evaluates them over a number of years. And the best families are identified and then plants selected to use as parents uh, for the next generation. So another approach to identify the best plants could be to analyze the DNA samples from each plant and select the best plants based on information in the DNA. And again, use these as parents uh, to produce the next generation. And this is what we call DNA-based selection or genomic selection. So this opens up some new questions. How do we study the DNA of grasses? And then how do we know when we have the DNA of a plant, um, for example, with excellent spring yield potential? So first we, we look at how we study the DNA of grasses. Um, so DNA contains all the information to build and maintain an organism. And the information in DNA is stored uh, as a code consisting of four letters, A, T, C, and G. And in grass, we know that this code is approximately two and a half billion letters long. So just a little smaller than the human DNA. And this huge code is tightly packed into what we call chromosomes. And we refer to all this DNA information as a plant's genome. So when we study the DNA, what we're actually looking for are differences in the DNA sequences. So differences in this four letter code. So in this example, uh, we have a stretch of DNA sequence from three perennial ryegrass plants. And we can see that the second plant has a difference in the code compared to the first. So it has an A instead of a G. And we can also see that the third plant has another difference at another position where it has an A instead of a C. So these type of changes in the genetic code at single positions are very common in, in the DNA of grasses. And these are known as single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs for short. So when we study the DNA of grass plants, this is exactly what we're after. So we want to characterize the differences uh, between the plants in their DNA sequence. So how do we find these differences? Well, we could use DNA sequencing technologies to read the entire two and a half billion letters in every plant that we want to study. However, at the moment, this is still a little too expensive. But what we can do is chop the DNA into smaller bits using molecular scissors called restriction enzymes. So these enzymes um, recognize particular pieces of the DNA sequence and they chop the DNA at these positions. And we can then select out fragments within a certain size range 
and we can focus our efforts on reading the DNA sequence at the ends of these fragments. So when we read the genetic code at the ends of enough fragments, we can build up a DNA profile for that plant across its entire genome. And this turns out to be much more affordable. So we can apply this approach to all the grass plants that we want to evaluate and build up a database of how the DNA differs across the plants. And this is the information that we use in DNA or genomic selection. But which plant has a, a good DNA profile? For example, how can we tell if a plant has the potential for high spring yield um, from this picture of DNA variation? So to be able to tell, if a DNA profile represents a promising plant, then we first have to develop a calibration. So in our example here, uh, we're trying to use uh, DNA as an indirect measure of spring yield. And to develop a calibration, we need to establish a reference population. So we take a large number of plants and we evaluate them for the trait that we want to select for. So in this example, spring yield. So some will have very poor spring yield, uh, some will have excellent spring yield. And at the same time, we also evaluate the, the DNA of the grass plants uh, using their approaches that we just mentioned. So where we chop the DNA uh, up into small fragments and we read the code at the end of these fragments. And we can then link the spring yield performance data in the field with the DNA profiles and develop statistical models that enable us to identify when a plant has good spring yield potential from only its DNA profile. Um, so we're basically learning here how to determine if a plant has good spring yield potential from only looking at its, at its DNA. What this allows us to do is take plants where we have no information on their forage yield potential in spring, for example. Uh, we can extract their DNA and generate our DNA profiles for each plant. And we can then use the statistical models that we developed on the reference population to predict the spring yield potential of the plants, again, from only looking at their DNA information. And these are what we call genomic estimated breeding values, because we're estimating the value of using this plant in further breeding from the information in its DNA or genome. So we can then rank plants based on these breeding values and only select the best plants uh, to use as parents uh, to produce the next generation. So just to recap, uh, we can study uh, the DNA of grasses by chopping their DNA up with molecular scissors uh, and then reading the, their genetic code using DNA sequencers. Uh, we can then compare the genetic code uh, across plants and identify uh, where the code differs uh, between the plants and then use these differences to build up a DNA profile for each plant. Uh, we can then establish a, a reference population of plants where we collect field performance data and at the same time, we generate DNA profiles uh, on the same plants, and we associate the DNA profiles uh, with the field performance data uh, to build up statistical models. And then using these models, we can take a plant uh, without field performance data uh, and simply generate DNA profile. Um, and from this DNA profile, we can estimate a plant's value to the breeding program. And we can then rank these plants based on their genomic estimated breeding values and select the best plants, um, again, to use as parents to produce the next generation. So what are the, the benefits of uh, selecting uh, plants using DNA information over simply selecting the plants uh, after field evaluations? So to understand how genomic selection can help us, uh, we can turn to a very important equation called the breeder's equation. And this equation, here describes their response to our selection or so irrespective of how we carry out that selection and the higher this value the higher our genetic gain and the equation simply says that the harder we select so the greater the number of plants we test the more precisely uh, we select for the trait uh, the greater uh, the genetic variation within the population of plants and the shorter the generation interval, so how quickly we can complete a selection cycle, then the higher our response to selection will be. And increasing our response to selection will lead to better varieties. So we basically want to increase the numbers above the line 
and decrease the numbers uh, below the line. So we look at ways that genomic selection can help us to achieve greater genetic gain uh, in forage grass breeding. So how we look at how we can use uh, genomic selection to increase the selection intensity, to increase uh, the accuracy of selection, and then also to reduce the generation interval. So the first thing genomic selection can do is to help us increase the selection intensity. So the more plants we can determine breeding values for, uh, the harder we can select. Um, and for a trait like forage yield, there are practical limitations to the number of plants we can evaluate in the field. And it's because we first have to cross pollinate plants uh, to produce families. Uh, these have to be bulked in isolations to produce enough seed uh, to plant down field trials. And these are evaluated over a number of years. So while this can be done on low hundreds, it's impractical to do on, on thousands of families. In contrast, we don't have the same limitations when it comes to DNA-based selection. So it's very easy to plant out thousands of uh, seedlings in small pots in the glasshouse, um, take leaf samples for DNA extraction and analysis, and generate breeding values, rank plants, um, and then select the best. So basically, in this case, genomic selection can allow us to increase the selection intensity uh, in comparison to field evaluations. And again, this has a positive impact on genetic gain. So it's basically allowing us to evaluate more plants. The second way that genomic selection can help us is by increasing um, the accuracy uh, with which we can make our selections. Uh, so one way that genomic selection can help improve accuracy in grass breeding is true within family selection. So we can do a good job of identifying the best families, um, uh, for example, for forage yield, uh, using field evaluations. However, there's still plenty of variation uh, for forage yield potential uh, within these families. So how do we go about selecting the best plants within the best families? Um, so we can't select um, the best plants based on the yield of a single plant, um, because it's been well established that there is no correlation between uh, the yield of a single plant and the yield under competition in a sward. But what we can do is evaluate the DNA of individual plants and use models that we've developed uh, on our reference population to estimate breeding values um, of each plant for, for forage yield, and then rank um, the breeding values and select the best plants. Uh, within the best families. And this turns out to be a very powerful tool uh, to help us increase uh, genetic gain. And the third way that genomic selection can help us is by shortening the generation interval. So when we say generation interval, we're referring to the length of time it takes to complete a single round of selection. So we can see that with field evaluations, this takes approximately uh, seven years because this involves making crosses, bulking seed, uh, establishing field trials, measuring over a number of years, and then selecting plants from the best families to recombine to produce our new population. However, in the case of genomic selection, uh, we can harvest our seed in August, uh, germinate and extract DNA from seedlings in the glasshouse. Uh, we can sequence the DNA and use the genomic selection models um, developed on a reference population to estimate our breeding values and then select the best plants to recombine uh, and produce a new population for harvest the following August. Um, so in this scenario, it takes a single year uh, to go from seed to seed, meaning we can complete many more cycles of genomic selection um, in the time it takes to complete a single cycle uh, of conventional selection using field evaluations. And again, reducing the, the generation interval has a positive impact on genetic gain. So just to summarize, uh, genomic selection is simply a tool that can be used for indirect selection uh, during plant breeding. So we're making selection decisions based on information in the DNA, uh, as opposed to making selections based on, on field evaluations. And we can use DNA sequencing uh, to identify differences in the genetic code between plants and relate the differences in DNA profiles, the differences in field performance. And we can establish these relationships on a reference population and build statistical models uh, that then enable us to predict the field performance when we're only presented with the plant's DNA profile. 
And then genomic selection can help forage breeding uh, by increasing uh, selection intensity, so allowing us to evaluate more plants, uh, increasing uh, selection accuracy, for example, allowing us to select for forage yield uh, within families, and then reducing the generation interval, uh, so speeding up uh, a cycle of selection. And all of these lead to greater genetic gains uh, for key traits <clears throat> and supporting the development of new varieties. So finally, looking to the, to the future, uh, we want to be able to use uh, genomic selection on all traits that are part of the, the pasture profit index. Uh, and we're in a fortunate position in Ireland that uh, the relative importance of these traits uh, have been quantified. Uh, and Thomas will talk a bit more about this next. Okay, Stephen, um, thanks very much for that. <clears throat> um, really good talk and, you know, really shows the importance of, you know, moving forward in breeding and applying new breeding technologies um, to develop, you know, I suppose, better varieties uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the industry. So the, the last talk is um, Tom, Dr. Thomas Tubbert, who's going to deal with, um, I suppose, the evaluation uh, expectations and, and, and new developments in, in the pasture profit index and, and and hopefully Thomas will say something about the clover profit index as well. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. And um, yeah, like Mick said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the pasture profit index and variety selection for 2021. So hang on here. Yeah, so the pasture profit index is, is a economic merit index. And what this means is it's essentially a ranking table for um, varieties for sale in Ireland. Um, it's used by the seed industry and farmers as a variety selection tool, and uh, it's also used by plant breeders, as Stephen said, to kind of dictate what traits of importance we place on, um, on traits of these varieties. So it shows breeders what they should be selecting for. So the index is made up of seasonal herbage yield sub-indices, which is the spring, summer and autumn herbage production. Uh, it's made of a quality sub-index, which is measured as dry matter digestibility in mid-season. Uh, it's made up of the silage sub-index, the persistency sub-index, and new to this year is the grazing utilization sub-index within the PPI. So this is how the pasture profit index looks. And we can see here that Aberclyde was the top variety within the 2021 PPI list. And this is because its uh, total PPI value is 225. So that's higher than all other varieties available for sale. Um, so this 225 is essentially the sum of the other sub-indices within the list. So that's your spring growth, summer growth, autumn growth, quality, silage, and persistency. And looking down through the list, we can see that um, Aberclyde, you could probably say, is good or strong in all traits, whereas there's other varieties on this list that may have strengths and weaknesses, and we need to take those into account when we're actually making variety selection decisions. So the data that feeds into the pasture profit index is taken from a couple of different sources. Uh, and these are the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines simulated grazing protocol. And from this, we get seasonal dry matter yield. And we also get quality data. Um, it's also taken from the DAFM general purpose protocol, which gives us uh, silage yield data that feeds into the PPI. And finally, we also have the Chagas Moor Park variety grazing trials, um, which gives us the utilization sub-index. So the agronomic performance of the varieties is measured in these trials, and this is compared back to the base. And the base is essentially the average performance experienced in Ireland on our grassland sports at the moment. And this is what uh, each variety's uh, plot performance is compared to. So also when we're calculating the, um, the economic values of these varieties, we need the trait economic value. And this is calculated based on the additional profit created by a, tr a change in that trait of interest. So for example, here we have, if you sow a variety with increased summer yield, you're going to get increased grass growth. That'll allow you to carry more animals. Uh, this is going to increase your production in terms of milk or maybe beef produce off that area of land, and that's going to increase your profit. So this is the economic value of um, that trait. So then how we calculate the trait economic value of a variety is simply the agronomic advantage of that variety over the base multiplied by the economic value of that trait. So um, now that I've introduced 
how the partial profit index essentially works, I'm going to talk about the new developments this year. And this is namely the new utilization sub index within the PPI. So um, grazing tight or to low um, post grazing sward height is a grassland management technique used by farmers and it's done to increase sward quality. Uh, this increased sward quality then will increase animal performance. Um, as you can see in this top photograph here, there's some herbage that's been left behind. And if we keep that herbage there, it's going to lignify and it's stemmy, and then that's going to reduce quality in the next rotation. So where farmers are faced with a situation like this, they have to make a management decision. And um, they can either return the cows to graze this remaining herbage. They can decide to top or mechanically remove this herbage, or else they can decide to let this herbage regrowth but actually cut it for bale silage as opposed to let cows graze it three weeks later in the next rotation. As I said previously, if none of these decisions are taken and the cows come in and graze three weeks later, they're going to be grazing lignified, reduced digestibility herbage, and that's going to reduce animal performance. So in Chagas Moor Park, we've ran an on-farm variety evaluation study um, for the last number of years. Uh, where individual varieties are sown uh, into paddocks. And we almost have 500 paddocks or individual data paddocks uh, across Ireland for this trial. So one of the main feedbacks that we do get off of varieties from farmers is that some varieties are more difficult to graze than others. And for many years, farmers had no indication of a variety's grazing efficiency prior to them selecting these varieties. And then when they sowed these varieties, they may have been left disappointed when they found the cows found these sports difficult to graze. So in reaction to this, we have been conducting plot studies in Moor Park for the last number of years where we are investigating the grazing efficiency of these varieties. And this was done with the intention of uh, developing a new PPI sub-index that would give an indication to farmers how these varieties are being grazed. So, as I said, we've been conducting new trials um, over the last number of years. Um, uh, we've been sowing them generally every two years, and uh, to catch up, we've been sowing them um, yearly as well. Uh, these pots are managed in a rotational grazing system where we take on average eight to 10 grazing rotations per year, and that's given us uh, pre grazing herbage mass or an average pre grazing herbage mass of about 1400 kilograms of dry matter per hectare at grazing. Um, the protocol for this study is essentially we take a herbage yield cut using the Atesia more, as you can see in this photo. So a herbage yield is taken on each plot. Uh, I'm also recording the pre-grazing sport height of each plot. The cows then come in and graze the plots. And after this, I take a post-grazing sport height measurement. So what we found was that comparing variety grazing efficiency based solely on post-grazing sport height was inaccurate. Because as you can see here, as pre-grazing sward height increases, post-grazing sward height should increase. Uh, and this is displayed with variety one. It has a pre-grazing sward height of about 9.25 centimeters. And therefore we would expect that variety to be grazed at 3.9 centimeters. Whereas variety two has a pre-grazing sward height that is about a centimeter higher. And therefore we expect that variety to be uh, grazed to a higher post-grazing sward height of about 4.1 centimeters. So when we were comparing variety grazing efficiency, we needed to account for these pre-grazing sward height differences between varieties. And then um, this is how we did it. So we can see here in this example, we have variety one, which has a higher pre-grazing sward height than variety two. And then when we look at the predicted post-grazing sward height to these varieties in the second graph, we can see that the predicted post-grazing sward height of variety one is higher than variety two. When we look at the actual post-grazing sward heights of these varieties, we can see that unexpectedly, variety one was grazed to a lower post-grazing sward height than variety two. Um, and so then what we do is we compare the predicted post-grazing sward height of the varieties, the green bars here, to the actual post-grazing sward heights of these varieties in red. We can see that for variety one, its actual post-grazing sward height is lower than as predicted, that's going to give it a negative residual graze sward height value, and that is indicative of good grazing efficiency. This variety was grazed to a lower post-grazing sward height than expected, so it's more utilizable. The opposite can be said for variety two, 
which, whose actual post grazing support height was higher than what was predicted for that variety. Therefore, this variety has a positive residual grazing support height value, and this variety has lower utilization. So this graph shows the residual grazing support heights of all the varieties, or many of the varieties examined uh, within the 2016 and 2018 grazing trials. Uh, within these two trials, we've evaluated 52 varieties, and last year we saw another 14 for evaluation. So um, we are going through a lot of varieties for evaluation. Um, the main points to take from this graph is that tetraploid varieties in this lighter green color tend to have negative residual grade sward height values, and therefore we can say that tetraploid varieties uh, tend to be more grazing efficient than diploid varieties, which tend to have positive residual grade sward height values. We can also see that even within ploidy, there is quite a bit of variation. So we can't say that, like there is, we can say that some diploids are going to be better than some tetraploids. So the next step moving on from this residual grade sward height value um, evaluation was to develop a utilization sub index. And to do this, we had to convert these residual grade sward height values into actual economic values. So what we did is taking variety one, its residual grade sward height was minus 0.21 centimeters. We then multiplied that by herbage density of 250 kilograms of dry matter per centimeter. And that gave us 53 extra kilograms of dry matter utilized per grazing event. We are assuming eight grazing events throughout the year. So we can say that variety one is going to utilize an extra 420 kilograms of dry matter per year. We then multiply this 420 euro by 4 cent per kilogram. That's the economic value of this trait. And that gives variety one a utilization economic value of 17 euro. For variety two, it has a positive residual grade sport height value. When we multiply that by herbage density, we say that this variety is going to utilize 35 kilograms less dry matter per grazing event. Again, multiply that by eight grazing events throughout the year. Uh, and we can say that variety two is going to utilize 280 kilograms less dry matter than the base variety. We then multiply that by four cent per kilogram and variety two has an utilization economic value of minus 11 euro. So we decided to convert these utilization economic values into star ratings uh, to make it more intuitive for farmers. So you can see that these ratings go from one stars to five star. A one star grazing variety uh, has a utilization economic value range of minus nine euro to minus 15 euro. Whereas our top five star varieties, they have a utilization economic value of plus nine euro to plus 16 euro. So again, this is the pasture profit index for 2021. We have our sub indexes going across here and we have our utilization index here on the right hand side. You can see that some varieties, instead of stars, they have dots for them. Uh, those are varieties that we don't have enough data for yet, but uh, these varieties are currently in trial. And um, we do, uh, for future iterations of the pasture profit index, there's going to be none of these gaps within the PPI. So when we're deciding on the use of a paddock, we need to, or when we're deciding what varieties to choose for, we need to decide on the use of the paddock. So generally we can say the paddocks are either going to be predominantly grazed or predominantly used for silage, or else there might be general purpose, which is a mixture of maybe one cut silage and grazing. So once we know what the use of the paddock is going to be, this is going to dictate what traits of priority we're going to select for. So when we're selecting for grazing swords, we want to be selecting on the quality sub-index, the utilization sub-index, and also on the seasonal yield sub-indices. Alternatively, for your silage um, swords that you're selecting varieties for, you want to pick varieties that have a narrow heading date range, that perform strongly in the silage sub-index, and also display good spring yield also. So to summarize, um, the pasture profit index, as I said, is a variety selection tool and it uh, is widely used by the industry, by all stakeholders in the industry, from farmers back to breeders. New for this year is the um, utilization sub index, which has been demanded by farmers for the last couple of years. 
And in the feedback we've received to date, uh, particularly the feedback I'm getting from advisors, is that them and farmers are really liking the sub-index and it, it does um, make their decision slightly easier for them. And uh, finally, looking towards the future, um, we don't want to stay still with this index. We are planning on introducing new traits. Some of these may be environmental traits. Um, we need to uh, conduct more investigations into this. And also, we'll also be planning on maybe introducing new species indexes. So the number one index that we're planning to introduce for the future is the Clover Profit Index. And um, I suppose we'll watch the space relative to multi-species wards and um, maybe in the future, if there's enough variety variation, um, these could be introduced as new species indexes. So uh, thanks for your attention and um, willing to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, um, Thomas, thanks very much for, for that talk. And um, we've had uh, you know three very good talks this morning, you know, outlining the, uh, I suppose, the impacts of, of breeding, the progress that can be made through breeding and, um, I suppose evaluation and making sure that um, making sure that the traits that are being bred for are reflective of what's there uh, at the industry level, and um, I suppose that's that's that that's probably a key um, a key uh, success of any breeding program. So there's a couple of questions. Um, so Pat, a question for yourself: um, uh, If you're increasing the genetic merit of a uh, of a positive characteristic, uh, what characteristics are you losing? Um, uh, the the person that is, 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 is assuming actual genetic, genetic potential doesn't change. Um, so I suppose if, you, if, we're, if you're just going for a dry matter production, Pat, uh, are you likely to lose something on quality or persistence? Or what's, what's your viewpoint? If you select for one individual trait and ignore the other traits, the other traits could go in any direction, depending on how they're so associated with the trait you're selecting for. So they could increase, they could decrease, they could stay the same. So therefore, in order to avoid that happening, you need to measure all important traits at every um, cycle of selection so that you can ensure that by increasing one particular trait, you're not necessarily reducing another trait. Okay. And just on the breeding program, Pat, um, in the last couple of years, we've seen probably a more, um, a, a more positive view of tetraploid uh, varieties. Um, they seem to be nearly making up um, or constituting about half of the grass seed sales uh, in, in, in the Irish Republic at the moment. The focus of the breeding program, uh, will it be toward tetrapoid or diploid or, or what's, what's your focus uh, for, for, for the next couple of years? I think it will continue to be based on both diploids and tetraploids. I think, sure, tetraploids look very good on the PPI, um, high yield, high quality, good graze out. But in practice, they're still sown as part of a mix. So that if you have uh, an excellent tetraploid and you sow that with uh, a poor diploid, you're going to dilute or reduce the quality of your mix by that, that amount. So as long as it's still sown as a mix, I think diploids are still important. I think diploids still have a use, especially on um, heavy land, on wetland to avoid poaching, to avoid ingress of weeds. I think as well, going forward, if you look to 20 year plus time period, will there be restrictions on herbicide use? Um, and if so, having a dense ward that doesn't allow weeds in will become even more important. So I think at present, I think there's um, a number of reasons why we should continue to breed diploids and tetraploids. Um, we can reduce the pressure on them. For, so for example, you could make a tetraploid crosses um, every, uh, for two years, um, say it's, it's every two years, and only do one year of diploids if you wanted to go down that road. And Stephen, um, genomic selection. Um, what, what's the likely genetic gain you think with with genomic selection? Yeah, so um, a number of um, kind of computer simulation studies have been carried out uh, in recent years. Um, so one. Very interesting uh, simulation was carried out by, by researchers in Denmark. And they basically simulated a conventional breeding program for 25 cycles. So I think it was nearly 40 years worth of breeding. Uh, very similar to the, to the breeding program that Pat laid out. And then at the, at the same time, they also simulated a, a breeding program with the, 
addition of genomic selection. Uh, and they basically compared the genetic gain in both scenarios. And what, what they found um, was that the genetic gain when genomic selection was incorporated was at least three times the genetic gain achieved without genomic selection. So if we consider that um, genetic gain uh, for forage yield has been estimated at uh, around 0.5% per annum, uh, then the research would say that on average, this can be increased to 1.5% per annum. So in their computer simulations, in terms of empirical evaluations of genomic selection, um, we've been doing some interesting experiments here in, in Chagas where we've been uh, running through cycles of, of genomic selection. And then this year we've been able to put these populations into the field so we can actually begin to, to quantify the genetic gain we've achieved. So I think the potential is there. Okay. So um, another question on the PPI, um, Thomas, is there any correlation between residual sward height and chemical composition? Yeah. So Noel, in answer to your question, I do have a slide here I can show you, which is, um, can you see this lads? Anyway, yeah, so you can see here we have our utilization value on the x axis and we have our OMD here in the middle. And you can see that there is a relationship between higher digestibility does tend to give you higher utilization. But the R squared here is about 0 0.55. So what we're finding is that, um, um, you know, quality is explaining half of the variation between these grazing varieties. But we can also hear that, say, at about 82. Uh, percent uh, DM or OMD, DMD, um, these varieties here still have a negative utilization values while these varieties here have positive. So there's also likely to be a kind of sward morphology effect taking place here, such that um, these varieties might grow more lower to the ground, they might be more dense in the base of the sward, and this is preventing the cows from grazing these varieties as efficiently as the um, more open varieties. So Quality, before we had the utilization sub-index, quality was a good indicator of graze out. But I think now that we're after providing more information of um, uh, what varieties are grazed out and what varieties are not grazed out. Another question then is, the, do you anticipate the utilization index will be transferred to a, a euro value from, uh, from a star value? <clears throat> yeah, so we went with stars for this year and I suppose we'd be open to using the euro values, but I have received feedback um, from some of the grass 10 lads and from some of the dairy advisors we have around Moor Park. And um, they say the feedback based on the stars, they really, really like it. And the farmers really, really like it. They can just say, generally be saying, if you are going with a grazing sword, you're going from basically a three star up to a five star, maybe avoiding your one and two stars. So look, we're open to going either way, but I think based on the feedback we've gotten from the stars, um, we'd be happy to keep it that way. The, the next question is about the zero persistency values on a lot of the varieties in the PPI. Um, have, you, have you got some comments on that? Yeah, so the persistency sub-index, the values are all zero, are all zero because we're finding that all these varieties um, are persisting for um, up to 12 years. So this is how the persistency index is calculated. We want varieties to last for 12 years or longer. Um, persistency is measured based on ground score change. So it's the change between a variety's ground score in after its first year uh, to when it finishes evaluation at the end. And then this change in ground score is then modeled out over the years. This change in ground score is then linked back to decline in um, dry matter yield. And we're finding that um, these varieties will maintain their persistency uh, for a long time. And this also links in very well with our on-farm evaluation studies where we're finding that uh, after seven years of evaluation, the drop in dry matter yield from its first year to its seventh year uh, is about 150 kilograms of dry matter. So we are saying there's very little, there's where these swords are well managed, we shouldn't be experiencing a massive decline in yield, and therefore the persistency of these varieties are um, all good. Um, and one a final question down on the PPI, uh, utilisation and soil fertility, any correlation or uh, no work on that? Is there, or have you any work looking at There's that? no work on it. I suppose we can just say that soil fertility is very important for the establishment of uh, new swords. So if we are considering doing reseeding, 
very important to take a soil sample and maybe your money like receiving is an expensive job and if you sow it into a poor fertility soil you're likely not going to get as good seed strike or as sward performance from this so maybe delaying your reseeding job and focusing on improving your soil indices before you actually do the reseeding might be a better um, way to go about. Okay, there's another question on, on soil characteristics and the, the um, Andreas is asking, the, the soil characteristics are, uh, are overall soil quality affect the choice of genetically improved grasses and forages. Um, Pat, do you want to take that? Yeah, so it, it's been found that in general, the, the, the ranking and the relative differences between uh, varieties under high fertility conditions uh, are, remain similar under low fertility conditions. Um, so presently, predominantly all breeding is done under high fertility conditions because we can make most genetic gain uh, under those conditions. Um, in terms of the soil type, um, the diploid perennial ryegrasses would be preferable to the tetraploid perennial ryegrasses on account of their higher sward density, which would re reduce the effects of OG. Okay, Stephen, uh, just a question. Genomic selection, can it be applied into grass clo into, into clover swards, into clover? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we've actually had a, a PhD uh, student, Katie Hedrington, working on that for the last few years. Um, so we've been able to take advantage of some historical uh, trial data and go back into the freezer and dig out the, the families and, and be able to do our DNA analysis on those. And we've actually been able to develop some, some promising uh, predictive equations for seasonal forage yield. Um, so that's, that's work that we're looking to, to try and expand on and build on. Um, just a question that's, um, about multi-species. Um, Swords, um, Pat, you kind of you, you tipped it in your your presentation. You know what what level of breeding uh, uh, have you come to understand is going on in in those other species? Are they where are they as regards you know you know you've seen clearly with both yourself and Stephen this morning, you know the clear breeding programs and progress that you have on traits. Where is let's say the likes of plantain chicory um, regard? In the, in the breeding process, process uh, at the moment? I think they would be considered um, very minor crops. So um, grass would be probably perennial ryegrass in Europe would, would be the primary crop. Even the, the legumes, the white clover and red clover would be considered uh, minor crops. So the, the herbs are even further below that. Um, um, the ones were I think using really at the moment, they're all New Zealand bred varieties. I'm um, not quite aware of any European varieties. So again, it, it's all about the economic return and the breeders see them as relatively small crops. Um, and it's something that going forward, they may have more of a role, but again, there'll still be only a small component of the sward. Um, so as such, again, the breeding emphasis would still be far less than that and it would be on the, the grass, the clover, which would be the primary component of the sword. Okay. And Stephen, Stephen, what's your view? Um, you, have, you have, you know, some experience in, in, in other um, countries on, 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 on these species. No, I think there's definitely an, an interest uh, in breeding some of these species, particular things like uh, sand fawn or bird's foot trefoil that have condensed tannins, um, uh, offering something else to the, to the mix. Um, but I think it's very, very early days. Um, but there's probably a lot of potential to make um, some quick gains uh, for, for some of these species, but it, it just, it'll take, a, it'll take some breeding effort. Look, guys, um, we've pretty much gone over time and we've had some very good questions on it. Um, look, if there's follow up, I suppose um, everybody's available on, on email for, for the audience maybe to follow up. Um, so look, all I've got to say is thanks very much for your, your, your presentation this morning. Very informative, very insightful. Thanks to the audience for, for, um, for listening and asking good questions. And thanks very much to Anne and Siobhan for, for making, um, making this happen. So the next um, webinar, <clears throat> our Research Insight webinar will be on increasing um, the welfare of farm animals and that's on the 26th of May. So look, uh, we'll leave it there at that. Um, thanks very much for this morning. Thanks to the people who have attended. And if there's any follow-up, um, you know, all the um, 
presenters are available on, on at their uh, Tagus uh, email addresses. Thank you all this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.